you know what separates us from every other organization? What you just experienced right there. There's a lot of churches today that will open in prayer. They'll take offerings. They'll invite people to join their church. They'll teach on good principles. They'll teach good ideas, amazing concepts. That will work. They'll give good ideas. But that DNA is the same DNA as the Lions Club does. The Red Cross does an amazing job at helping people, serving people. The Salvation Army does an amazing job at reaching into places like Oklahoma and serving those people. And the church should be doing that. But the difference between other organizations and his church, his bride, is his presence. What is the motivation of our heart? What is the thing that pushes us? There's a lot of great people outside of God doing great things. So it's not just the fact that I'm doing great things or I'm doing good things. It's not just the fact that we're in church. It's not just the fact that we give. It's not just the fact that we read scripture. It's not just the fact that we say prayers in a one directional fashion, but it is the worship of people that have a heart towards God that invite his presence to come that changes an atmosphere, that changes a culture, that impacts a city, that impacts environments, that changes families, that changes marriages. It's the presence of God that sets us apart from every other organization. Without his presence, we're just kind of going through the motions and we can ring a bell at the end of the day and say, check, we got that done. But it's his presence, it's a relationship, folks. It's, a, it's this thing of being, having an awareness that he's in the room right now. It's a, It's having an awareness that he's riding in the car with you. It's having an awareness that he's going before you, he's behind you, he's beside you, he's underneath you, holding you up, he's drawing you up to higher places. There's a there's an actual awareness, there's a there's an awakening in your spirit that says he's here right now. And that's what makes it easier for people that recognize that he's here to worship him. See, when you're in a in a relationship, and, and please hear my heart on this. Thank you for standing for a minute. But in a relationship, any relationship that demands, let's move on to the next thing, isn't much of a relationship. Honey, you know, I enjoy talking to you right now, but really um, news is on at six, so let's cut it short now and let's get on to the what, supper. Well, let's get our supper done. But, but maybe there's a moment, there's a place where you're looking into the eyes of the one that you say you love and you just go, let's just stay here for a minute, can we? Are you, are you tracking with me? Do you understand? See, that's what separates us. We're not looking for, okay, we got worship done, and now let's get on to something more. The whole atmosphere should be charged with the fact that he's here. <laughs> I don't know. Man. I just, I'm just thinking that, you know, if he wants a relationship and he wants intimacy, you know, and some of y'all, some of y'all, you know, some of y'all, you come in here miserable and you're going to leave here miserable. That's not worship. You should leave here differently than you came. You should learn to come into his presence so that you can go out into society carrying his presence that changed you while you were in his presence. You know, that's, that's what I hope. I hope when you go to work tomorrow, I hope when you leave here today, that you, you're, you, I hope when you leave here today, you can't be offended with anyone because you've been in God's presence. I hope when you leave here today, you don't, you don't sit, I hope you're not sitting here right now in your posture evaluating what everybody else is doing. I hope you're not sitting right here evaluating what I'm saying to you right now. I hope you're not getting all twisted up because, well, you know, I hope you can see God as the loving God that he is so that you can worship him in spirit and in truth. And as a result, have him change your heart, have him change your mind, have him change your thoughts. I'm just thinking that if we're going to be in church, let's let him do something in us so he can do something through us. You know, I mean, if we're going to, you know, because how many need a stinking miracle today? Today you need a miracle. How, how many have family members that need a miracle? Yeah. See, in God's presence, miracles happen. That's his nature. How many of you know that God is supernatural? Yeah. Anybody, anybody not get that? How many know that God is not man? He's not man. He's not woman either. Don't get so, don't think, ladies. God is spirit. He's beyond us. God is love. God is good. I'm going to just give you some really good news today. He's not even mad at you. He took that all out on his son. 
He's not in a bad mood. He's not miserable. He's not looking at you, finding out what's wrong with you, trying to figure out what's wrong with you. He's looking at you and saying, let's call forth what's right in you that I deposited in you. So Father, we declare that that stuff that's inside of us that you want to get out, draw it out, God. Let you be seen more in us than the dirt that wants to cover you up. Come forth, have your way. Be manifest in our hearts and your presence come wash over. And as we're into your word today, let, the, let your word be so full of life that it washes away the contamination of the weak. Things that, interactions that we had, attitudes that we had, conversations that we had, and things that we were exposed to that were counter your culture, God. And we release your kingdom. Your kingdom come, your will be done here in GT as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen. Hey, you may be seated. Ushers, will you come? Um, I want to just, today, I don't ever, for those of you who know, I never do this. I never, ever, ever do this. But I'm going to change it today. We're embarked to launch a revival at the Chemung County Fairgrounds beginning tomorrow. We're setting stuff up. We're going to go down and prepare the land. I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you. Anytime you can make the Chemung County Fairgrounds this week, get there, walk the grounds. Right, Howard? Let's walk the grounds. Let's pray. Let's pray that the blood of Jesus would so saturate that ground that when people, starting this coming Friday night when it launches, that people will walk in and they'll see an atmospheric difference because the presence of the Lord is so strong there. With that, we are running, we are running into expenses after expenses after expenses on Thursday, on Friday, I was told that I had to come up with $4,200 for the insurance so we could do the revival. Somehow God worked that out, and we're going to have to do it afterwards instead of paying it up front. They're kind of working that whole deal out with us. God's really cool about those type of things. But lots of printing costs, lots of advertising costs, paper costs, all that kind of stuff. And we just, we would like to, if you would, we're going to pray. And this week and over the next two weeks, listen, no pressure. I'm sharing with you. I'm sharing with you. God knows exactly who can. God knows exactly who will. It's not a matter of how much, but it's a heart deal. If God is speaking to your heart today, so Father, as you speak to us, whatever that is, would you help us as a body come together as one and accomplish these purposes, these things in our earth? We have an open door. We have an open heaven for the next three weeks. Father, may us, let us not miss one opportunity for one soul to come into your kingdom, for one family to be restored, for one father to come home, for one wife to turn and come back to her family, for our economy to rise up, for men and women to come into your kingdom, for businessmen and businesses to begin to flourish, for our economy to be turned around, for households to be turned around, that, Father, our government would lead well, that our schools would awaken again to a understanding and awareness that there is a God who is bigger than anything else that could ever come against this community. And, Father, we break the last 40 years of curse over this town, over this, over this county, and we speak life. So awaken up, Shimon County. Wake up, Elmira. Wake up, Horses. Wake up, Big Flats. There's a God who his kingdom has no end. And let this kingdom become a kingdom of our God, I pray. Father, bless, minister to, empower every family as they're in a place of obedience and giving of their tithe, and they're in a place of their heart as they give to you generously today, Father. For whatever that is, over the next three weeks, whatever you put on our heart, we want to be quick just to respond to your voice. Jesus' name. Amen. Watch this video with us as you take the offering today. It's only one minute long. So give fast.
impacts everything in culture, but it begins by a spiritual awakening. So Howard was just saying to me, he had a, just a, a, a vision, a thought, an impression, whatever you're comfortable with verbiage-wise. Um, <laughs> he saw Moses and other men of God, they'd look down from a mountain place, Joshua. They'd look down and they would see the promised land. They would see that place. And they would, they would whenever God's presence was in a place, they would declare it holy ground. Well, you know what? I'll, if you know history, Shimon County Fairgrounds, that area right there was known for a lot of torture, a lot of death, actually. Shimon County in history, all right? This was the place where during the Civil War, or yeah, during the Civil War, a lot of blood was shed unrighteously, okay? But his presence, when it comes, it turns unholy ground into holy ground. And <laughs> I just think, I don't think it's coincidental that our county consistently is the worst county for suicide. I don't think it's, I, th I think it's been a plot, I, th I don't think it's a coincidence that our county is so known for lack of fathers. I don't think it's a coincidence. I think it's been a plot of the enemy and it's time for the church to be awakened to see because the church is the enemy of the enemy. Because yeah. <laughs> everybody else is unaware that he's even an enemy. So Father, I just, I come into agreement with Howard's statement. Shimon County is going to become holy ground. <laughs> How amazing would it be if Shimon County became an open heaven, a source a source where heaven can invade earth, and all of a sudden, everybody from around the world will look and say, what happened to Shimon County? What changed? We want to be able to bring that to our culture. So, Father, let your kingdom culture come to our county. Have your way in Jesus' name. Thank you so much, you guys, um, for your love, for your generosity. This church, um, <laughs> in case you don't know, I mean, it's like, a lot of what is happening with our ability to give food and everything away is because our church is recognized. I'm trying to find my passage I want to read today. <laughs> our church is being recognized as a church that cares about our community. And so um, please, 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 Tuesdays, Thursdays, Sundays, be blessed. Be blessed with what we're being blessed with so that you can continue to be a blessing um, to others. You know, because... You can't give unless you receive, okay? So, huh, Father, we just want to receive from you this morning. In Jesus' name. Man, I have some good news, good news for you today. We're continuing in worship, and what we're trying to do is we're trying to unpack, we're trying to define, we're trying to discover um, intimate ways, greater ways, if you would, deeper ways that we can worship God. And we're going to spend the whole summer in this area of worship. We're going to spend a lot of weeks this summer in the area of worship. I don't think it's, I, don't, I, I think it was just a sovereign act of the Lord that, that we as a church would begin to move in that on the heels of our eight weeks of revival that we have with Dr. Wayne William, the fact that GT University is ramping up this fall um, to, 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 to increase by, by three times what it was this year. I don't, think it's, I don't think it's a coincidence that churches are beginning to come together and understand that revival is needed. I don't think it's a coincidence that the revival is here right now this summer um, because of what God wants to establish this year in the earth for our community. And I think we have a, a, a moment and an opportunity to do that. But it's going to be founded on the foundation. It's going to be able to be set and, and, and he'll, he'll be able to rest on a foundation of worship. How many know that his presence, he's not coming to a place where he's not wanted? How many, yes? Okay, why did God destroy Sodom and Gomorrah? It, it, some people say because it was so sinful. I've heard people say, you know, New Orleans got hit, and it was a judgment of God. I heard the Twin Towers, you know, it was a judgment of God. I heard all this kind of stuff. Can I just tell you something? God doesn't inflict disease into a person so that he can heal them. The devil is the one who's come to steal, kill, and destroy. God has come to give life and give it abundantly. We gotta stop blaming God for what the devil's doing. Now, listen, well, God must have gave the devil permission. Really? then why did he say that the devil came to steal? Thieves don't need permission to take from you. Yes? 
all right? They don't, yeah, I mean, it's like, so what do we have to figure out? We've got to figure out how to partner with God to do what Jesus did and to destroy the works of the enemy. We're to destroy the works of the enemy. We have dominion, we have authority because he has all authority and we're joint heirs with him, so let's start walking as though we got some. <laughs> Don't let your marriage get infiltrated. Don't let your kids go wayward. Don't, you, can, you have the authority to stop the enemy's lies in your own midst. Cast them down. You don't, need to, you don't need to entertain those thoughts. You don't need to ha- walk in doubt and walk in fear. And when you begin to do that, when you start to walk in a confidence, when you start to walk in authority, not a cockiness, a confidence and an authority, the devil, guess what happens? You stop being worn down by the devil, and the devil starts being worn down by you. Do you think that, do you think that God's afraid of the devil? Do you think he's afraid to sin? <laughs> he beat it once. He'll beat it again. Oh, by the way, it was done once and for all. Defeated. It's a defeated enemy. So, how does the enemy get access to you? When you come into agreement with his lies. Any thought that's in your head that's not issuing forth from him should not be there. About you or about anybody else. How many times have we had thoughts about God that wasn't God's? We start blaming him. Why would God let this happen? See, when you really know God, when somebody says something about God, since you know God, then you know that since you know God, that what they're saying about God can't be true. Yeah? So I want to talk to the church today. This passage in Ezekiel chapter 14 is to the church. It's to Israel. How many know that we are? The new Israel, we're the chosen people, we're Zion, we're we're engrafted in. How many know that, right? Okay, watch this. Beginning in verse one. Now some of the elders of Israel came to me and sat before me, and the word of the Lord came to me saying this, son of man, these these men have set up their idols in their hearts. These are elders, you ready? These are elders. These are church folks. These are people that should know better. Ezekiel 14, beginning with verse one. And he says, these elders have set up, have set up idols. Idols didn't just come into their life. They've set up idols where? Where'd they set up the idols? In their heart. Do we have it up on the screen? I just want to make sure. Set up idols in their hearts. And put before them that which causes them to stumble into iniquity. Should I let myself be inquired of at, uh, should, I, should I let myself be inquired of at all by these men? Therefore speak to them and say to them, this is what the Lord God says, every one of the house of Israel, how many? Every one of the house of Israel who sets up his idols in his heart, sets up what? Idols, where? In his heart, and puts before him that which causes him to stumble into iniquity, and then comes to the prophet, I the Lord will answer him who comes according to the multitude. I will answer him according to the multitude. I will answer him according to the multitude of idols that he has set before him that I may seize the house of Israel by their heart. Say heart. Heart. Because they are all estranged from me by their idols. Therefore say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, repent, turn away from your idols, and turn your faces. In this passage there, I looked it up in my little Bible software. It means set your mind on, set your mind on, or set your mind away from all of your abominations. Stop looking at them. Stop focusing on them. Stop paying attention to them. Get your eyes back. Repentance is a mindset change. We've made repentance something that it's not. We've made repentance like you gotta beat yourself up. Repentance is not beating yourself up. When you have godly sorrow, it produces repentance, but repentance is I'm gonna start thinking differently than I used to. I'm gonna stop having my mind set on things that will draw me away from God. I'm gonna set my mind on things of above that draw me towards God. 
Is that, and that, see, so repentance is actually a privilege because when you fall down and you got your eyes on your failure and you got your eyes on your, on, on, on your lack, uh, all of a sudden you can take and you say, no, I'm not gonna look at my failure, I'm not gonna look at my lack, but I'm gonna look at God's grace that will empower me not to live in failure and not to live in my mistake, but to close that chapter and say what's done is done, let it be under the blood of Jesus Christ, and I'm gonna take my eyes off of that thing and set my eyes solely fixed upon him. How many know you're way more empowered when you're looking at him than when you're looking at your sin? That's the power of grace. Therefore say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, repent, turn away from all of your abominations. For any one of the house, say that with me, for anyone, for anyone. So who's this for, church? Anyone. Anyone of the house of Israel, and oh, guess what? Well, I'm not, of the, I'm not a part of GT. Oh, well, you're still stuck too because you're here today. It says this, <laughs> for anyone of the house of Israel or of strangers. Now, we're not going to call you strangers, but you're our guest. So welcome to the house of Israel. Watch this. Who dwell in Israel, who separates himself from me and sets up his idols in his heart and puts before him that which causes him to stumble into iniquity, then comes to a prophet to inquire of him concerning me. I, the Lord, will answer him by myself. I will answer him by myself. I want to tell you something. When it gets to the point where you stop listening to God's men and and God has to answer answer you himself, you might be in a little bit of trouble. Pastor Scott, I'm not accountable to anyone. I'm just accountable to God. You are on thin, thin ice. Because guess what? We are accountable to each other. And if you're not accountable to that which you can see, I promise you, you are not being accountable to that which you cannot see. God will understand. Ever hear that statement? God's okay. Me and God, we got our own thing going on. So you listening by, you listening by GTV today? Sorry. Better get in the house so you can be accountable so that you can have everything that God has planned for you. Everything that God has planned for you. Dun, dun. Love that iPhone. Um, ringtone. I will set my face, watch this, I will set my face again. This is what God's response is going to be to these situations. I will set my face against that man and I will make him a sign and a proverb and I will cut him off from the midst of my people. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. And if the prophet is induced to speak anything, I'm going to tell you about that in a minute. I, the Lord, have induced that prophet, and I will stretch out my hand against him and destroy him from among my people Israel, and they shall hear their iniquity. They shall bear their iniquity. The punishment of the prophet shall be the same as the punishment of the one who inquired that the house of Israel may no longer stray from me nor be profaned any more with all their transgressions, but that they may be my people. How many want to be his people? They may be my people and I may be their God, says the Lord. How many want him to be your God? Yeah. Well, this is how we're going to figure out how to do that today. So let me just say to all the prophets in the house, be very careful, be very careful that you don't come into agreement with the wrong well source you better make sure that you're staying in agreement with the right well source. Otherwise, you suffer the same punishment as the one who is carrying the idols and the iniquities. Let me give you an example of what I mean by that. If a person has an idol and you come into agreement with them having that idol, your penalty is the same as theirs. Yes? Somebody comes into my office and they get counsel from me and I go, oh, it's okay. You just go ahead and you just keep living in sin and deciding to move in that direction. I'm, you know what? God understands. It will be all okay. See, here's the deal. Ch- church, we are supposed to accept people, but we never accept sin. Sin's our enemy. Sin is an idol. Sin's an, sin is the thing that separates us from God. Why would we want to coddle something? Why would we want to be okay with something? Now listen, sinners, we have wide open arms for. And, 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 and see, the thing is, it's the grace of God, and here's the deal, it's the presence of God, it's the kindness of God that will drive them to that word we just learned a little bit earlier called repentance. 
So I don't stand there like Jesus. Jesus said, I didn't come into the world to judge it, but to save it. So we don't stand in a place of judging them. But what we do is, ready for this? We speak to the spirit that's influencing them instead of blaming them for it, for whatever it is. You follow me? You look at them and you look beyond them and you see the thing that's behind them that they've placed in front of them. <laughs> yeah. Is that yeah. right? So, that's, so then you're, what you're able to do is you're, you're, it's like Jesus said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. Was he speaking to Peter or was he speaking to Satan? He said, so talk to the attitude. Talk, talk to the hand. No, talk, to the ad, talk to that one, that spirit, that attitude that's driving that person. How many know when you see some people, their eyes get a certain way, and, and, what we, and, and they're, maybe they might look a little dark. Maybe they're a little confused. Maybe they're walking in doubt, whatever that is. Sometimes we've got to address that thing that's influencing them rather than dealing with them. Peter, in one moment, said, some things that, God, that Jesus said, man, you got that from God. You, you're hearing from God on that. That's a revelation from the Lord. And the next minute he says, get behind me, Satan. How many know in a minute we could be hearing from the wrong well source? In one minute. And so we have to address. And see then, see what we do is we stay in honor when we begin to address the thing who's really our enemy because our enemy and our struggle is not against flesh and blood. It's the one who influences flesh and blood. That's why we need discernment. That's why we need spiritual gifts. That's why we need insight. That's why, see, the, the biggest thing about the church is we don't really believe or we haven't practiced or we haven't walked in hearing God's voice. But hearing God's voice is the absolute necessity to walk as a Christian now. So if there's nothing else you're pursuing, get to know his heart. Get to know his voice. Spend time in the word and read that word until you hear his voice. Man, I, I'm telling you, it will, it will save you so much heartache. You know why the School of Supernatural Ministry is so amazing? Is it because it teaches people how to lead. It teaches people how to hear his voice. It teaches people how to hear his heart. How many know that in marriages, sometimes you need to hear God's voice. You need to have some wisdom. You need to have some insight. You need to have some revelation about what to do with the situation because there's not a model by which to follow. Yes? How many know there's unique situations that we come into every single day that God knows the answers to, but if you can't hear his heart, if you can't hear his voice, then you can't come up with the answer to the problem. Yes? And we try to, I, I, so many people I know are still making decisions by earthly means, by worldly standards. Let's make a pros and cons list. Well, if we do this, this is results. We do this, you know, so there's some good, and we weigh it out. And then, we, and then I, I, there's people that are still making decisions financially. Well, I'm going to make $100 more a week if I work here compared to if I work over here. Can I just tell you something? First and foremost thing you got to ask is, Lord, I want to be where you want me to be. I want to do what you want me to do. And how are you going to do that if you don't know his heart, if you don't know his voice? I've asked pastors about this revival, and they're like, well, we think it's a good idea. It has some good principles. There's this thing. I'm like, well, what did God say? Well, I don't know. Well, see, that's the problem we have right here with the elders right now. These elders in this situation were coming to the prophet to say, what's God saying? Can I tell you something, elders? We gotta have elders, we gotta have leaders that hear God's heart, Amen. hear God's voice. We need Sunday school teachers that hear God's heart, hear God's voice, because there's kids out there today, they're gonna be out there today that need to hear from God, not somebody's written ideas or principles. Now, those principles can be God's principles, but God knows what principles we need in the moment of our lives that we're in. We hide his word in our heart so he can draw it out of us at that appropriate time when we need it in that season that we're in, to be prepared in season and out of season. Am I making sense? Okay, so, so let's, figure out, let's figure out how to align ourselves, how to posture ourselves, and I want to just start by doing this. I want to make a little, I want to I perk your ears up by making this statement. God has always been concerned about our hearts. The church is more concerned about sin and idols. Okay, I want to tell you something. God doesn't care a hoot about idols. God doesn't care a hoot. Now, I'm, I'm, going, to, I'm going to quote his second commandment. Let there be no graven images, right? Is it really the graven images that he's concerned about, or is it what the heart is worshiping that he's concerned about? See, I can have all kinds. I can live in the land of idols, but it's what I focus on that he's concerned about. It's what I'm giving myself to that, I'm, that he's concerned about. Because I believe, here, here's another challenging statement. Church, we were created for darkness. Follow me. What are we? We're light. What is light good at? 
dispelling darkness. But if the light only stays in light, what are we dispelling? We're just getting more light. Look how bright we are. Hide it under a bushel, no! Hide it under a bushel, no! Hide it under a bushel, no! I'm gonna let it shine. The problem is, is that we are, we're afraid to shine our light in darkness. Because the reality is we're afraid of darkness. We're afraid that darkness is gonna, have you ever seen a dark light? I've never seen one. I've only seen flashlights. Yeah, I've never seen a light that you could, a, a dark light that you could turn on and create darkness. Darkness can never dispel light. Because wherever there's light, there can't be darkness. So we're supposed to be carriers of the light. We're supposed to be burning, not just reflecting, but burning his light, that we're a torch. We're a fire that goes in, and all of a sudden you walk into a room, into a cave, into a dark situation, and it lights up and you can see clearly. But see, that light, that fire is his presence that you're walking around, that you're carrying in, and when you, and this is, and this is really crazy, you ready for this? Pastor Scott, I don't think we should, this whole thing of all these different gifts and all that kind of stuff, and, you know, I, I'm an apostle or a prophet, or, you know, I have these, I'm, this scare. I'm, I'm okay with pastor, but these other things, like, ooh. Can I ask you something? Was Jesus an apostle? Yes, he was the best one. Was Jesus a prophet? Yes. Was Jesus a teacher? Yes. Was Jesus an evangelist? Yes. Was Jesus a good shepherd, a pastor? Yes, he was all of those things. Who are we supposed to be like? So do you think you could possibly look like a pastor once in a while or a teacher once in a while or an evangelist once in a while or a prophet once? Apostle Paul said, I wish y'all prophesied. I wish y'all would prophesy. Oh, yeah. what if I make a mistake? He's not afraid about making a mistake because this is what he said. When you open your mouth, I'll fill it. We're afraid to open our mouth. Everybody do this with me. That, was I drooling just then? Because I kind of felt like I was drooling. <laughs> Here's the deal. We just got to be willing. Pascal, I don't know what to say. You had the spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwelling within you. I'm pretty sure that he knows what to say. So, but the problem is we don't want to release our tongue. Hmm, that's a good word. We don't want to release our tongue. We don't want to be put in a position. We don't want to be embarrassed. We, we're kind of like, we don't want to, Hide under bushel? Yeah, I am. We need to begin to move out in a confidence in him, a trust in him, that when we open our mouths, he'll fill it. Because he knows exactly what those people need, and he's sending us who will be his bride, his hand, his mouth, his feet extended to a world that desperately needs to know him. Why can't God just save everybody himself? He can, but he's chosen you. Why can't God just heal everyone himself? He can, but he's chosen you his bride, to represent him well as his ambassadors in the earth. And when an ambassador speaks for his, the president, the king, he speaks the same authority. Do you think there would be anybody sick in here if Jesus was in the room? <laughs> Guess what? He is. Because you're here. The problem is we believe the lie that we can't do what Jesus did. And I'm telling you, Jesus said you'll do the same things I did and even greater. But the problem is we're so, we've so bought into, we've made excuses for him. Well, it must be God didn't want to do that. It must be God doesn't want my marriage saved. It must be God doesn't want my kids um, back in the house. It must be God doesn't. Yes, he does all the time. But the problem is we start, here's the deal. If God doesn't want to save everyone, then why should, there, we, we could always make the excuse, well, there's that 1% that he doesn't want to save, so they're probably a part of that 1%. The problem is 80% of the people think they're that 1% then. If we don't have the theology in us that God wants to heal everyone, and we say, well, God only wants to heal 99%, then all of a sudden, all of a sudden, can I tell you something? As a father, when my babies are sick, I want them healed. And I'm a stinking earthly father. He's an amazing father. I promise you, he wants you to live well. He wants you strong. He wants you strengthened. He wants to encourage you. But we so are stopped because it's impossible to please God without faith. And the enemy knows if we start believing his doubts more than we believe his truth, God's truth, then all of a sudden our doubts are more powerful than our faith. Also, I'm telling you, when I pray for somebody, I just believe, man, you should be healed because by his stripes you are healed. That same penalty he paid for, I absolutely believe everyone should be saved. Is there anybody who doesn't believe everyone should be saved? 
I believe it. His will is that none should perish. His will is that none should perish. His will is that none should perish, the Bible says. Am I right? So if it's not his fault, who's it on? Church, rise up. We need to take our place in planet Earth because I promise you that darkness isn't dispelling darkness. And the light's supposed to. He's the father of lights. <laughs> I don't know, whatever. I just thought that was kind of cool. What was I talking about? Oh, it's all about the heart. He doesn't care about idols. He doesn't care about those things. Don't get all stressed out. Oh, you see that person? I know they, I got, I know they got idols in their life. Look at them. I, I know. Look at that. They got an idol. Look at them. They got an idol. God's not worried about that. That's what he's worried about. Well, look at this. Deuteronomy 10, 16 says this. Therefore, circumcise the foreskin of your heart and be stiff-necked no longer. Well, you ever see stiff-necked people? <laughs> you know, Couldn't you believe he said that today? Stiff-necked, man. Let your heart be, let that flesh be cut away. Stop with the attitude. Stop with the offense. Oh, you know, stiff-necked people are the easiest people to get offended. You ever notice that? But people who just kind of, <laughs> they don't get offended. Just go with, man, whatever, Lord, whatever. Can you believe that person? Sometimes I think we think that unbelievers should act like believers. And we get, I oh, can you believe them? And how about just walking through them? Let's get them into a place of safety, a place of help. Let's raise them up. Let's, in, let's impact them with the presence of God. Let's, let's actually love them so much the way that God loved us. Watch this, Romans 2.29 says, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly. Hear that? And circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit, not in the letter. Hear that? Whose praise is not from men, but from God. See, when you got saved, God cut the flesh away from your heart. If you really got saved. If you have an idol in your heart, if you have an idol in your heart, notice I didn't say made all these idols out here. If you have an idol in your heart, I want to show you four things that it will cause. Here's how you'll know. Here's how you'll know. Here's how you'll know that you're struggling with idols. See, can I tell you something about idols, first of all? Idols are no more than demons. Now, what, the, what happens is the demon attaches itself to the, that graven image that you produced or that you built up or that you have, but, but it's really it's demonic influence is what it is. So I want to address that because that's really the, where your struggle is. That's really where the problem is. And let's really get to it to what it is. Instead of, because I, I think we battle against a lot of things that we don't need to be battling against. And I think our battle should be focused on that which will win, the, win a victory. Did everybody just hear that? Let's go get a victory. Let's get marriages back. Let's stop suicide. Let's stop depression. Let's stop addictions. Let's stop people having idols in their life. Let's stop pornography. <laughs> Why, not? Right. Why not? Why not? Let's stop gossip. Yeah. Let's release purity. Yeah. See, if you're going to bind something to the earth, you better release something behind it, or the binding's not going to do anything. Woo. All right. <laughs> Let me tell you the four things, because we've got to get out of here, because, man... Hungry. All right. Number one, number one, if you have an idol in your heart, you're going to be experiencing spiritual deception. If you have an idol in your heart, you're going to experience spiritual deception. You're not going to see things spiritually right. Have you ever walked in that thing and you look at somebody, I don't, I don't get it. I don't understand it. Look, I don't understand. Why are they doing that thing? I don't understand. What's wrong? What? And, and so many times, so many times, we can't, we, we can't even... We're not willing to ever grow beyond being one year old spiritually because we're deceived. We're thinking we got it all. We're thinking that salvation covered it all. It's done. We've made it. We've arrived. There's so many people walking in that deception. Salvation is the door into a kingdom that has no end. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's just the beginning point. People say, I'm saved. I'm good. 
No, you're not. Salvation, but I, please understand me. You can't even get into the kingdom without salvation. That, but that's the beginning point. I'm going to make a statement to you right now. Do you know why this church exists? This church does not exist so that you can have community. Community is the beginning point of impact in a culture. You gotta get your house in order so that you can go out and impact the world. But the purpose of getting your house in order is to impact the world. It's the beginning point. Community is just the beginning point. It's that place where you get charged up, where you get filled up, where you get taught, where you get equipped. But that's not the end of it. We don't just get equipped to stay inside the community. We get equipped to change the culture that the community resides in. Yes? Am I, am I reading the same Bible as you guys are reading? Because every time I read it, that's what I hear. This church, I, I went, I went, I, there's evangelist in me. Memorial Day, I'm out there and there's thousands of people. And we were the light to thousands of people. And everyone was saying, oh, where are you guys from? What church are you from? Where are you from? Like, what? Because people are drawn to light like bugs. But if the light's not shining, the bugs aren't coming. <laughs> don't, don't look around and say, you're a bug. <laughs> but see, the thing is, though, here's the deal. We gotta start drawing. Every church in this community should be overwhelmed because Jesus said, overwhelmed with people, not overwhelmed with bills. Overwhelmed with people, why? Because Jesus said, if I be lifted higher, I will draw all men unto myself. Everybody out there at that Memorial Day parade, I am still being an evangelist. Everybody out there at that Memorial Day parade, we're going, they were attracted to the presence of God as a church was celebrating him. You can cook your hot dogs and stay at home if you want to and keep it under the bushel. Or you can go out into the highways and the byways and you can compel them to come in. But your compelling is not get into church, get into church. Your compelling is turn on the light and let the bugs follow you. I don't know where that came from. Who knows? Spiritual deception, Ezekiel 14 and three. We're gonna hang right there in that passage, but it says, son of man, these men have set up their idols in their hearts and put before them that which causes them to stumble into iniquity. Should I let myself be inquired of all by them? See, here's the deal. Spiritual deception deceives you so much, ready, that we begin to cater to the idol. We're so deceived that we think the idol's part of God. I, oh, ready for this? I've been in counseling sessions where a guy has come to me. They're not here now, so don't look around anybody. <laughs> a guy came to me and he said, yo, who's that girl that sits right in front of me and my wife? I said, well, you know, so, so, so. I really feel God drawn me to her. I said, well, it ain't God of this, it may be God of this world, that's not the God that we serve. Yeah, no, no fast forward three months. Yeah, like we've been kind of hanging out, we've been going out to dinner, we've been, we've been praying together, reading our Bible together, and we really feel God speaking into our relationship. See, when you're spiritually deceived, you'll say God about everything, and you'll blame God for everything. But I'm gonna tell you something right now. God is not a liar. He doesn't change his mind. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he's not gonna give you permission to walk into idolatry and to sin and coddle you in the process, thinking that, oh, this is the ultimate. And if you said I do, that's a covenant that can't be broken except for by death. Okay, so is that just, now, God hates divorce. Lisa and I have both been that. So I speak from a vantage point, both of us have experienced ongoing death because of a thing called divorce. The consequences, and if I could use this word, honey, the punishment that we both had to walk under because of what 
those type of things of co- broken covenant, what it brings on your life. But I thank God that there's a grace that says, you know what? That day is done. You can't go back. You can't change it. But I promise you, I promise you, I promise you, if I become presumptuous about this thing called sin, and I think that God's grace, since he did it once for them, would do it okay for, for you to do it. I've heard people come to me and say, look how good of a relationship you and Lisa have. I want that, so I'm going to leave my wife. Really? You're stupid. Don't mess with his grace. His grace is there to empower you away from sin, not into it. Hmm. I'm not yelling at you. I'm yelling for you. Because I want that attitude. I want that thought. I want that demonic spirit, that, that lie to be broken over our culture. Too many people are walking away from their kids justifying that God must be okay with it. Too many pastors are, are, are ashamed of the Holy Spirit, and that's got to be broken because he's the third person of the Trinity. We've got to stop being ashamed of the very thing that empowers our lives to be able to speak to demonic forces and tear down strongholds and principalities in our culture, but you're not going to do it by principles alone. It better be an empowered life that it sits under the authority of a powerful Christ who sits under submission to a powerful God that wants to change the world. Ah. I'm not even preaching at the revival. I'm just going to run sound. But guess what? I'm going to be preaching at the revival. Because somebody's got to hear my message that will change their lives. Can I tell you something? Somebody's got to hear your message that will change somebody's life. So church, you may not think you need revival, but they do. So the church better be at the revival so that you can revive a culture that needs desperately to be revived because it's dying or it's dead. (sighs) Oh, that's point one. Man, I got I really, really prepared too much stuff. Point number two. Oh, let me just do this first. Romans 13, 14. You might want to write this one down. Romans 13, 14. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Did you hear me? Put on. Put him on. Put him on. Right? And watch this. Make no provision for the flesh. That's our job. We put Jesus on. No provision. Flesh, you have no right to me. None. Zero. See, a person, if they, they're, they're in deception when they become presumptuous and they give opportunity for sin. Let me just tell you something. If a person is dabbling in pornography, I'm promising you, you're going to find a way to put that before your eyes. And you get presumptuous. I've had people say, I know it's wrong, but God will forgive me. Don't be under the lie of presumption. You are on such thin ice. <clears throat> Make no provision. Make no provision. Make no provision. Throw that sucker out. Don't coddle that wolf. A wolf will never be your pet. I'm smiling. Am I right or wrong? Number two. If you get an idol you also get an adulterous relationship. It's called spiritual adultery. I'm gonna make this real simple. It says this, that I may seize the house of Israel by their heart because they are all estranged from me by their idols. Can I just tell you what, I'm gonna paint this picture for you. It's like a husband and a wife being intimate in bed together, in the marriage bed, and the wife decides to go out and sleep with another and be intimate with another, and then come back into that same bed and expect to be okay with God. Can I tell you something? Husbands, if your wife did that to you, what would that do to your heart? What would that do to your relationship? What would that do to your intimacy? See, I think what happens is we begin to compare God to those adulterous idols that we place in our lives, and we weigh it out, which do we want more? And if this this adulterous idol deal doesn't work out over here, 
I'll be back, God, when I need you. I just, let me just read you what he did in that passage because I, I want you to understand something more about God's grace. Because God says right now, you're his bride. You're his bride. He's married to you. Yet he says, you've left my house and you're living with another. That's that estranged. That's what it means there. You've left my house. You've decided to go have an affair on me. See, sin is spiritual adultery. Getting out of bed with him, being intimate with another, then come back, back into bed with him as though he does not know, really, but I gotta tell you something. Because in this passage, it says here at the end of it that he turned his head away from them. The next verse on. And I just gotta let you know something. God is not angry at you when you do adultery. God's not angry with you. He's not mad at you. How do I know that? Because in Isaiah 54, and you might wanna have this one written down too, Isaiah 54, 9, it says, just as I swore in the time of Noah <laughs> that I would never again let the flood cover the earth. Do you, you know, he's not gonna let the flood cover the earth again. Am I, yes, he swore. How do you know when God swears about something, he ain't doing it? Am I right, yes or no? Watch this. Just as I swore that I'd never cover the, flood, the earth with a flood again, so now I swear. I swear by the moon and the stars in the sky. Right, watch this. He says, I now swear that I will never, never, never again be angry. I will never, ever again punish you. Do you know why? <laughs> because of this cemetery word. I mean, cem cemetery. Cem what do we send people to? Seminary. Seminary. It's just, uh, <laughs> uh, they're kind of the same. Um, it's, it's, uh, listen, um, listen, we have a college, so I'm not against, okay. But here's the deal. This word's called propitiation. Can I tell you what propitiation means for all you cemetery graduates? Propitiation means this. Oh, say this with me. Oh, oh. now say it like you mean it. Oh, oh. of God's wrath has been satisfied. <laughs> you, all of God's wrath, it's been satisfied. Jesus took it all. All of God's wrath was poured out on his son. If you don't think God loves you, you don't know him. Oh, everything that I've ever done. He didn't get mad at me. He's not here to punish me because he put it all of the wrath that was meant for me went on his son. So I can, man, that's empowering to me. But the enemy wants to keep telling me, yeah, you're no good. You'll never make it. You'll never accomplish. You look what you've been. And there's pastors in this community that keep still trying to hold people under the same wrath that God delivered them from. blood of Jesus, it covers it all. Not to, uh, not to keep doing it. It covers it all to set you free from it. That chapter's closed, never to be mentioned again. It's under the blood. It's in the sea of forgetfulness. It's as far as the east is from the west. That's propitiation, cemetery folks. That's a good word, propitiation. Say it with me, propitiation. No, you didn't say it. Say it again. Propitiation. That just feels, don't you feel powerful saying that word? That's a powerful word. Jeremiah 3, 6 says, The Lord said also to me in the days of Josiah the king, Have you seen what backsliding Israel has done? She has gone up in every high mountain. Remember that word, high mountain. And she's gone up under every tree. Remember that tree. Can I tell you something about high mountains and about trees? Those are places where idols are built. There are some places in your life you gotta stay away from. Until you got victory over it, stay away from it. Let me give you a for instance. If you're struggling being attracted to a certain person and you're married, stay away from that certain person. 
When that thought comes in, replace it with something good and pure. Well, we're just hanging out. We're just talking. We're just texting. We're just dabbling. We're just me and the wolf. I got my arm around them. Jeremiah 3.9 says, so it came to pass through her casual harlotry. I've never really known what casual, casual harlotry is, but I'm thinking is we're just kind of, we're just friends. We're just talking. <laughs> I get these little Google eyes every time I see her. Casual harlotry that she defiled the land and committed adultery. Watch this. With stones and trees. Have you ever wondered how does somebody commit adultery with stones and trees? Can I tell you how? Idols are made out of wood. Altars are made out of stone. Again, it's not the graven image. It's what the heart is worshiping. It's what have you fallen in love with more than him. It's what do you have to check with first before you do what he's asked you to do. I'll just throw it out there to you. If he's asking you to give something and you ask your checkbook before you give, I'm not saying don't be a good steward. You, that's not that. But it's like, you know, well, I got a boat payment. You know, I got a, you know, I'm planning on this whole deal. Lisa knows this. I'm not saying this, and this isn't to pat us on the back. But we have, we have not gone on three different vacations in our lives because God told us to do something else with the money. It's okay Believe it or not, not to have a vacation. In fact, one of my board members said, you know, you know that'd be a good idea this year not to have a vacation to me. He was just kidding, I think. <laughs> I'm not looking at it. I'm looking at, I'm looking at I'm, Paul Sedgwick is who I'm looking at. <laughs> Number three, I close with these two. <laughs> That was a nice setup, wasn't it? Number three. Well, first, what was number one? Number two? Number three is spiritual deafness. Number three is spiritual deafness. If you're, if you're dabbling with an idol, you're probably not hearing God real well. Because the idol's probably speaking more than he is. These elders in this church were deaf. Why? Because they had, elders, they had something wrong in their heart. Pastor Scott, why, why, you know, I, I feel like I should, I, should be able to be an, I should be able to be an elder. No, you got something wrong with your heart. I should be able to be a teacher. Ah, oh, dude, I'm, yeah. it's a heart deal. It's always about the heart. It's not about your gifts or your abilities. It's always about your heart with God. Number four, because I want to hit this real quick. There will be spiritual, spiritual punishment in your life as a result of idols. But, Pastor Scott, you just said that God's not angry, he's not punishing us. Exactly. It will be your poor choices that cause really bad consequences that will punish you. Did you hear me? Did you hear me? God's not bringing that punishment. Stop blaming God. God loves you unconditionally. But your choices will bring punishment into your life. And not only will it bring punishment into your life, it will bring punishment into your family's life, into your church's life, into your children's life, into their, into their children's life if you don't make the right choices. Three generations can be affected by our sin. But let me tell you something, hundreds of generations will be affected by our righteousness, church. If we rise up in this moment, our kids are gonna benefit. Our grandkids are gonna benefit. Their grandkids are gonna benefit if we'll rise up and take our places as his bride. So you got to decide, are you going to have a spiritual awakening or are you going to be spiritually dead? Because if you're spiritually dead, there will be consequences to your deadness. Not just for you, but to your family. And I'm, I'm, listen, I'm not, I'm not throwing this out on anyone, but your best chance for your family is that if mom and dad, you rise up and you take your place as spiritual heads in your house, and you start fighting for your families, and you start getting wisdom from heaven, and you start giving insight from heaven and revelation from heaven that will win your children back. Good principles aren't enough to win them back. Good ideas aren't enough to win them back. Good concepts aren't enough to win them back. Good disciplines aren't enough to win them back. But a revelation and an encounter with the risen Lord will win them back. 
shepherd will have to do something with them. Let me just tell you something. Paul went from killing all kinds of Christians to being the greatest apostle ever. How? One encounter with the risen Lord. Your kid's best chance is to expose them to his presence and have an encounter. And what you get here of his presence, take home and let it be there. If you're not worshiping God at home, you're probably not worshiping. If you're not into the word at home and hearing God at home, you're probably not hearing him. This shouldn't be the only place that the Bible's cracked or that you sing a worship song. It shouldn't be the only place that he gets recognition. But he said, in everything that you do and in all of your goings, everywhere that you go, do it as unto me. That's a form of worship. And watch worlds, your worlds be changed. <laughs> or not. It's our choice. <laughs> I'm done. How many said, yay? <laughs> Let's stand. Father, ministry team, will you come? I know that there are people that need to get back on track. And I pray as we're worshiping, they come to this altar and do just that. I know there's people here that need to leave their burdens at this altar and take upon themselves your burdens because yours are much better. I know there are people here today that need to be saved, need to be healed, need wisdom, need revelation, need insight. But Father, I ask that they would just take five minutes, be in your presence, and listen for your voice. Before they go out there, let them come in so that they can go out. This is what we're gonna do. Sean's gonna play this song, okay? And, and, and today is our missions Sunday. And I'm gonna have Sean invite you for your missions givings to be done right at the end of this worship. But I wanna give God an opportunity right here, right now, to impact, to seal by this Holy Spirit what the word was today and come into agreement. We're gonna take five minutes and do that. So let's all, if you're, if you're comfortable with this, and even if you're not comfortable with it, get out of your comfort zone if you will, if you want to. And let's just, you know, even if it's like this, let's get our receptors out and let's seal. If you believe that this is a word, that this was his word, let's seal this to our hearts right now as we worship this song this song <laughs> in Jesus name my whole life I place in your hands God of mercy humble 